All right, good evening, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission public hearing on temporary rules for chronic wasting disease management. My name is Carrie Ruhlman and I am the agency rulemaking coordinator. We're running tonight as a hybrid public hearing. So we are both in person here um, at the headquarters building and on Zoom. This is our first hybrid meeting, so please bear with us. We will do our best. Um, for the folks using Zoom, just a few housekeeping items. All participants will remain muted until we begin accepting comments. We have disabled the chat function for this hearing, but we'll be monitoring the Q&A only for technical difficulties. So please don't type any questions or comments in there. We won't be answering them. After the proposed temporary rules are presented, we will accept verbal comments from those individuals online who registered to comment, and I'll provide instructions at that time. And finally, just as a reminder, written comments can be submitted via email or online at any time through our website. So before we review the proposed CWD rules, I do wanna mention that uh, this temporary rulemaking is a little different than the commission's usual temporary rulemaking. Due to the detection of CWD earlier this year, executive director Cameron Ingram invoked emergency powers on April 12th, 2022 to assist with the detection and isolation of the disease. To continue management, temporary rules are required to replace emergency powers. Uh, the rules proposed specify requirements necessary to reduce the movement of the disease and um, decrease infection opportunities. So at this time, I will go ahead and hand it over to Brad Howard, the chief of our wildlife management division to review each of the proposed rules. Oh no. Nope. Somebody, somebody's texting, I don't know what that's from. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight and everybody that's uh, participating online. Uh, I'm gonna go through the temporary rules uh, as proposed. These, these if, if, if you're familiar with the executive orders that, that the director has issued, these, these rules will mimic those. Uh, however, the first rule is basically definitions and the general requirements for uh, the chronic wasting disease management statute uh, rules. So these, these basically just line out the, the, the definitions that you can see here, what is chronic wasting disease, uh, CWD management area, surveillance area, those types of things. So the, the first rule simply simply uh, provides the definitions of what these things mean as we move forward through the rest of the rules. Uh, 10B0502 is uh, defining the CWD surveillance area. And this area specifically defines uh, what, what we will call the surveillance area uh, around the known positive that we did get this, this past year. Um, it identifies uh, an, an area known as the primary surveillance area, which is number one there, which is the five mile radius uh, around the, the index finding. And then the secondary surveillance area, which is number two, which is the 30 mile radius around that. And this area actually defines clearly marked landmarks, roads, rivers, streams, so that hunters can know where they're at inside the zone. It's not just an imaginary circle on the map. And if you look at a map, you can see the maps. We have the maps online. 0503 goes into detail as to the restrictions and the requirements within this surveillance area. This is the, uh, the greater surveillance area, uh, restricts the placement of bait, food, food products, minerals, or salt licks to purposefully congregate wildlife. Uh, Basically, outside of the hunting season, it does provide exemptions for the placement of bait and food within the hunting seasons, uh, and it, it also identifies the, the things that cannot be taken outside of that surveillance area. If those look familiar to deer hunters, these are the same rules that apply to importing deer carcasses from other states into North Carolina. So basically, everything within that, the only thing that can come out of that surveillance area or boned out meat, cape tides, et cetera, antlers, uh, clean lower jaw bones, teeth, the same things that can be legally imported into the state are the only things that can be taken out of that surveillance area. Um, the main purpose for that is to stop the potential transmission and spread of the disease through uh, contaminated carcass parts. 0504 specifically talks about the primary surveillance area. This is that, this is that area within the five mile radius of the index pot, uh, uh, location. Reason for five miles is that's the average dispersal distance for yearling bucks. So we draw a five mile radius around there, hoping we can figure out 
how prevalent it is in this area and where, where, where is it. Uh, the requirements in the primary surveillance area are that all deer must be tested during the black powder and the all lawful weapon season. So for the entire black powder and gun season, mandatory testing will be required there. I do wanna point out that something that we, we, we omitted in the form when we were at, uh, at Yadkin County the other week, the, the testing does not cost the hunter anything. They just submit the samples and the testing is done through, 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 through our services. Um, Cause somebody asked me after the meeting, how much did testing cost? And I said, uh, uh, it doesn't cost any, anything to the hunter. Uh, and then of course it, it restricts cervical carcass part originating from inside that primary zone to be transmitted uh, outside of that zone, um, except for a couple of sections allows for double bagged and taken directly to our servant health cooperators in Yadkin and Sur Surrey County. We've got uh, health cooperators that work with us um, to, to collect CWD samples and they know how to process and handle the parts. So we're gonna let people take the, the, if they double bag the carcass and take it to one of those processors in Surrey and Yadkin, or Yadkin County, they can do that um, out in, outside of the PSA. Can I ask a question real right quick? Uh, let's, get, let's go through this and then we'll come back to it, okay? I'm just gonna ask, you got black powder rifles. Yeah. Why not both of you? That is a good question. So it's basically a volume thing. We feel like if we're going to require it to be mandatory, we need to have we need to have people out there to work with the hunters and get there's a lot of different ways to submit your samples, but bow season is, is basically a volume thing. We just don't kill enough deer every day during bow season. Um, but we we are encouraging testing. We will have freezers and and we can talk about this after the meeting, but we'll have freezers and drop-off locations. We've got cooperators that are working with us, processors. I encourage everybody to get every deer tested <laughs> in the surveillance and the, in the primary and the secondary, but we're not making it mandatory because we have sample criteria that we need to, to determine. Our big thing right now is where is it and how bad is it? That's what we need to know these next two to three to four years. That's what we got to find out. Where is it distributed and how bad is it? So that's our focus here. We need as many samples as we can out of the PSA, and then as many as we can out of the secondary surveillance area, but we're not going to make it mandatory. We're going to make it mandatory during the gun and black powder and PSA and for the, and I'll get, I'm going to go ahead and switch over it because that leads me right to the next one. The secondary surveillance, the mandatory time frame for that period is the two weeks of black powder and the first week of gun season. And we get a lot of deer harvest in this, in this Northwestern deer season in this zone. We feel like we will meet our sampling quotas to, to detect it at, at the prevalence rate we're looking for we're anticipating significantly more samples than this, those three weeks. And we will make that available to, to the hunters. There'll be freezer drop stations, a number of cooperators that are working up there. But um, these are the, except the, the rules as they apply to the secondary surveillance area, which is that, that 30 mile area around it. Um, as I said, mandatory sampling during, during those three weeks. Uh, same thing with the cervid carcass and carcass parts originating from inside the SSA. They, those, those parts can't leave. They have to stay in that zone. Um, and um, there, are, there are some exceptions for uh, our cooperators who are gonna be working for us, working with us to get them to see, get carcass parts to sealed landfills, but they'll have to be permitted through the agency to take care of that. Nobody, uh, all the hunters are supposed to drop their stuff and leave their stuff inside the zone. And that's the biggest thing. That's one of the things we're, you know, one of the most specific things we want to do right now is uh, our dear biologist, Mariah Bogus, who's, who's online with us. You know, the, one of the key points is the, how can we protect our deer herd in the state is, is don't give it a ride. You know, if, if, if you're in an area where CWD is known to exist, get the deer tested and, and keep, the, uh, keep the carcass parts in that zone. Don't take it somewhere else because that's one way it can move. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Sure. And we're going to do, do comments. Uh, can, can I just, is, is there anything? Can I ask them real quick? Is there anything? Okay. We're good. So I'm going, to, I'm going to let Carrie take the comments. Okay. And I'll be here too. So at this point, we'll go ahead and start accepting public comments. For those folks in the room, if you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, just make sure you speak loud enough that we can hear. We have mics, but we want the people on online to be able to hear your comments too. Um, and we need to record them. For the people that are attending virtually who registered to comment, we will call your name and unmute you. You will be prompted to unmute yourself and then you should be able to speak. 
Um, we do ask that regardless of how you're commenting tonight, that you keep your comments respectful and to about two minutes or less and that you only comment on the proposed rules. This is a public hearing and we're unable to answer a lot of questions that are not clarifications on the rules being proposed. Um, if you do have questions, we have a CWD website set up. Um, I will show you that at the end of this hearing. It does have a frequently asked questions section and informational videos on CWD. It's a really good resource. So at this time, we will go ahead and open the floor for comments. David Worley. Michelle Poe. Michelle, you're unmuted. No. Okay. Kirk Willard. Here, yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, we can hear you. Okay. Would you like to comment? Uh, no, I just got, I just, I, I'm late getting on, I just got on. Oh, okay. All right, Kathy Pedrick. All right, Jody Rivas. All right, Dominic Canazaro. All right. Um, Amy Carter. Can you unmute Dominic? Okay, go ahead. Dominic, we're trying to get you unmuted. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, my question is, uh, can a hunter debone his own deer? And what part of the deer do you want dropped off if you uh, score a trophy buck in the areas? Yeah. Yes, the hunter, absolutely, you can debone your own meat. We would prefer to you to debone and leave the carcass inside the zone. Is okay. Best mechanism. As far as what part we need for testing, the actual only part we need for testing are the ref, retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are lymph nodes right at the back of the deer's jawbone, really. Um, and typically, what we ask is that you know just drop off the head in one of the freezers or something. We'll pull the samples. Uh, if you happen to take a uh, a buck that you want to want to cape or get mounted, um, you can take it to any of the the. Uh, uh, Servant Health Cooperating Taxidermist inside the zone. They can cape, the, cape it for you and they can pull the samples for you. You can cape the deer yourself and just bring the, the, uh, the, the part of the, the, the head that's not caped to us. Um, on some days we will be there, our staff will be there and you can just drive by there and they can, they can work with you to get the samples collected. But the only thing we actually need are the, are the lymph nodes, which are about you know the size of the top of your thumb to be honest about it, but- um, okay. But, but to get, so, them, we need that. We need the head to get in there to get them. Okay, so if a hunter capes out his own deer and then takes the skull cap off and leaves the brain matter and drops the rest of the head off, that would be fine. That would be absolutely perfect. Yes. Excellent. As okay, as that's all. I'm, as long as it's inside that zone. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, actually, all of our hunting areas are in that inside the uh, secondary zone. Right. Okay. Yes. That would that would okay. work just fine. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Michelle Poe. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Um, I am a recently retired fawn rehabber 
and we have some uh, unique questions or concerns. Is there uh, anyone who can provide us with sp uh, specific training as to our responsibilities and compliance? So there will be a Zoom me uh, meeting uh, scheduled very soon with Fawn Rehabbers. Um, just Fawn Rehabbers. Just Fawn Rehabbers. Uh, right. About specific, specific. and um, trainings that are available. Okay. Did you have a comment on the rules? Um, no, we just needed okay. some as a, no, no, no special comment, just a, a request for training. Okay, thank you. Okay, Kirk Willard. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. I, I live up in uh, Surrey County. We have a, a, a very large uh, processor up here, does a great job. and. Um, I was just wondering, it, it, you know, I was from what I was reading, it's like this, it's spinal column fluid and brain fluid, lymph nodes, kind of where this is spread. Um, are, are you guys working with processors or, um, I mean, it seems like things could spread there very easily if, you know, they're processing hundreds and hundreds of deer. Um, yeah, yes, we, so we, we have a number of our processors who are actually part of our Servant Health Cooperator Program. Yeah. Uh, and of course, now that we do have a known positive case of CWD in that area, um, we will be you know, testing it there. We're gonna work cooperatively with uh, NCDA and we're working you know, to give, give uh, processors some guidance, some recommendations, some best management practices, those types of things to, to you know, basically try to be as, uh, as safe as we possibly can, both, both in containment of the disease and, and, you know, as far as processing the deer meat. So we, we are in contact with most of them. We, we know most of our processors and we are working, it's a work in progress, working with them and giving them some, some guidance as well. And we're working with Department of Health as well to, to, to work on that. So it's, it's that's still going to be a, a, an option, maybe one of the better options is to, to take the deer to a processor. Yes, that's that's correct. Uh, inside, you know, as is it, you you can take the deer to to. There's a couple of processors, I believe, or one. I'm not sure exactly off the top of my head. From the PSA, from that five mile zone, there's there's a couple of processors that you can take it to. That's actually outside of the PSA, but it has to stay in Surrey and Yadkin County. And then in the secondary zone, there's a number of cooperating processors. And, and you can take the deer to those and there they will work with us as far as carcass disposal and, you know, or, or another option is to debone your meat and just take your meat there to have it processed and that kind of thing. But the processors will still be up and running and will be working cooperatively with us. Okay, so, so a processor right across the line in Stokes County is still going to be okay for us to take? It's going to be okay for you as long as you're in the secondary zone. Yeah, if you, if you yeah, have. I, I yeah, I am. I'm, okay, yeah, you're I'm fine. Northern, northern part of Surrey. Lines. You can cross county lines within the zone. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, Ronald Armstrong. Troy Carroll. Michael Deal. Can you hear me? Yep, we're down here. Okay, good. I'm a service health cooperator for Ardell County. My concern is the, the waste, the byproducts from a deer, and I am a processor, so I have to transfer this waste to a landfill. The landfill for the county is south of I-40. I'm concerned about that because I know for a fact that there is deer in the landfill. So I'm concerned in that area, but at the same time, you know, personally, I live just six miles outside of the secondary zone. Two thirds of my hunters come from the secondary zone. I need a little help here. I, you know, I want to, I want to help whatever I can. So give me some advice. 
So two two questions for you relative to commenting on the rule. Are are you suggesting that we move the secondary zone line in Iredell County to the county lines? Is that what your suggestion? Uh -huh. Or are you below 40? I'm not sure where you're at lo location wise. Okay. I'm six miles west from the I-40 pin. So that puts me outside of the secondary zone. But like I said, two thirds of the deer hunters that come to me for processing, they're gonna be coming outside of that zone. So maybe there's, maybe there's- So you're north of 40, but west of I-15? Yes. Okay, so are, are you commenting that perhaps we should include all portions of Iredell County north of 40? No, I'm, I'm just saying that maybe you on your processors that's within a mile or two in the secondary, in my situation, would be acceptable. Okay, we'll take that under consideration then. Thank you. Okay, and my second comment was, you know, the Iredell County landfill is south of I-40. So anybody that lives north of 40 and harvests a deer in the secondary, they're going to cross the lines taking their byproducts to the landfill. They, yeah, well, they can't take the, the, the products south of I-40. They'll have to go north or they'll have to put them in, in, in a certified disposal container that's, that, that's permitted to go to a sealed landfill. There, there's options for us to get the stuff to a sealed landfill, but it's got to go through the permitting process, probably with the waste disposal company. So, so the, hopefully that, 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 that's a work in progress. We're, we're continuing to work with the waste disposal companies to make sure that's available to the hunters. Okay. Well, I'm, like I said, I, I want to do whatever I can to help as a processor okay. and at the same time as a servant health cooperator. And, and there are options and, and we're going to try to continue, you know, the, 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 the point, the purpose is to keep this stuff contained and, and, and get it disposed of properly, be it in a sealed landfill in, inside the zone or, or in another sealed landfill. But, but there's a couple of different routes we have to take to do that. What we don't want is people throwing it in the back of their truck and driving it down on their own. That's, that's, the, you know, that's the big thing we don't want. We want it, we want it to be organized in how we dispose of these carcass parts okay. outside of the zones. So we will, we will, uh, we will continue to work on that. Thank you for taking my comment. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Chris Jansen. Rebecca Scott. <laughs> Brenda Donis Lemus. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just uh, became aware of this disease today and uh, I'm concerned about it. I don't know anything um, other than what I read in the internet. And according to the research that I read is that it was not that this disease was not in North Carolina, number one, but apparently it is. Another thing that I read was that it is not, trans not transmittable to people but I guess that if you are taking all these precautions, you are concerned about that. So my question is, um, you know, do, are you concerned about it? And second, um, what can be done for to prevent this disease in the deer that we have here? Yeah. Um, so to answer, so. Well, what we're doing tonight is, is the first steps and what can be done. Um, and, and that's sort of to find out where it's at, to understand you, you're correct. This is the first known positive of this disease, but we are the 28th state, 29th, 29th state to have detected the disease relative to the human risk factor. Um, basically there is no, there's no evidence, the CDC, um, and World Health Organizations, there's still no evidence that this particular disease, chronic wasting disease, is transferred from deer or cervid species to humans. A similar disease, mad cow disease, did do that. Some of us are familiar with mad cow. Uh, at present, the CW CDC recommends that we not eat deer that test positive. Otherwise, all normal health precautions uh, uh, should be fine and, and venison should be fine to, pr 
to consume. Um, that And um, to get more information about CWD, about CWD in North Carolina, about our plans or actions, I, I would recommend that you go to our webpage, which is ncwildlife.org forward slash CWD. And Carrie's going to have it up here in just a few minutes on the presentation so you can see it again. There's a lot of frequently asked questions and a lot of information about the disease and, and options and opportunities to try to manage the disease. Thank you. Kelly Borough. Are there any other comments? Yes. What's the turnaround time on testing uh, from the processors? Um, well, so the turnaround time for testing is, is, is it's, it, it depends is, is, a, is a little bit of an answer, but um, and it depends on where we get the sample from. We're going to, we're going to, prioritize and make every effort to get our samples from the surveillance areas into the labs to get tested as quickly as possible. The testing process itself is two to three weeks. It's just it's, it's, it's a whole process of fixing the tissue, staining the site. So, um, and then there's a process of getting it from where we collect it to the labs and from the labs and then the results back to us. So, you know, right now, because we've been in surveillance mode, it's been, you know, one to three months because we've just been in surveillance mode. Now we're gonna to try to ramp that up and shorten that time period to the extent, the greatest extent possible. Um, you know, my crystal ball says best case scenario will be one month turnaround. Um, we're working with NCDA at the Neutroxler lab over here. They've got, a, they've got a CWD lab over there, a testing facility. We've been, you know, we, we've been preparing for this for 20 years. And, and, and so we're working with them now to get their lab up and running. So hopefully be able to test in state, which will greatly, increase the turnaround time in logistics, but it's not going to increase, it's not, it can't decrease the testing time but so long. So, you know, our recommendation for hunters is going to be to process your deer yourself, have it processed, however you do it, freeze the venison, wait till you get your test results back, and then you'll know if they're not detected, you, that everything's fine, you can go ahead, and if it's, if it's detected, then we'll certainly let you know, and you'll know that, and, and, and follow the procedures. Ironically, we've been doing that for a number of years with a lot of hunters that hunt in other states that, that bring their venison and, and, and meat back. And then they get the notification months later that says, hey, that mule deer tested positive. And so, you know, we usually work with them to go and get the meat and dispose of it and just incinerate it and stuff. So that's, that's a non-committal answer, but it's the best one I got. I mean, we're, we're going to do the absolute best we can to make it as fast as we can, because we know everybody's waiting to get their results back. I will point this out, and, and it'll show up on the screen. Uh, you can go into our live harvest reporting and find my harvest, past harvest, click that button on our webpage, and there's a there's a thing to the rest. Once you've submitted your sample, it'll, it'll show up there. It says, see my test results. So when they come back, they will show up there. So that's how you will know. Now, if, if, if one of your deer comes back positive, we're going to contact you personally. Right. Um, but, but otherwise, you'll be able to uh, go on there and check and know when your test is cleared, you'll be able to see it. Now, for consumption outside of those areas, is there any concern? Um, and, and it's kind of a general question. Um, I'm sure if you're in close proximity, we know, we know deer move. And right. They have their routes. Um, but... Uh, would that be recommended in testing that? And if so, how would a hunter have that? We will continue our testing procedures for all the rest of the state. And in fact, we, we encourage submission for, for, you know, cause look, we found it here, but we don't know where else it might be. We hope it's nowhere else, but so we, we will, we will continue our surveillance methods just like we've been doing. Um, there's no reason at present for us to think this is, you know, that there's, you know, it's, it's, it's anywhere else. We don't have any indication. We've been tested. We tested over 7,000 deer last year um, with a focus up in this area because of the positives that were found in Virginia the last two years, just 30 miles north of our border. So we, we knew it was close. Um, so, and when we've been testing over, you know, we tested over 7,000 deer statewide and we, we haven't detected it anywhere else yet. So, you know, I, I would say if you would like to get your deer tested, drop it off at one of our freezer drop stations, there'll be an online interactive map. We have them spread out across the state. Um, uh, c contact your local deer processors, your local taxidermists who might be participating in our cooperators and, and it'll, it'll, it'll go into the system and it'll get tested just like all the rest. And you can just hold on to it if you just want to be for sure that your deer tested negative. Um, 
but um, you know, we we won't we'll be really ramping up in this area to find out what we got and where it's at. So that that's our goals for that. But but there will be testing available for all hunters statewide across the state. Yes, sir. How far east in Virginia has it? It is so it's on it's it's way it's west of Charlottesville. Oh, okay. It's it's I think Cole, if you line it up, Culpeper County is probably the furthest east. But this this last one showed up down in Montgomery and Floyd County, uh, down around Blacksburg, which is very which was a long way from their other CWD hot zone. So this is clearly a new unassociated probably outbreak from their original, which is way up in the north uh, west corner of Virginia. But I think if I, if you drew a if you drew a line across, I think Culpeper County's prob was well. That's not true. I think it's up in Loudon, up in northern Virginia, and that creeps across. But down along our border, no, nah, it's 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 over towards Blacksburg as far as it is that we know of now. What you're laughing at my geography? <laughs> <laughs> now, he knew what I was talking about. <laughs> All right. Any more comments on the proposed regulations? <coughs> All right. Show me what they say. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Just got a question. Um, you were saying that uh, somewhere here in, in Raleigh was going to do the testing for the the test of the year for CWD. They'll do the initial test. We're, 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 we've got the lab is set up to uh, run the initial test. Um, we're, we're working on that process right now, working with NCDA over at the brand new uh, Troxler Laboratory. So they'll I have just that one side, or y'all going to try to have multiple sites. Well, we have the options to continue to use Wisconsin's lab, which is the one we've been using and any anything that t any and, and they can run lots of tests in the lab. I mean, so they get these things processed through. They, they run lots of tests and then anything that, that would come back positive actually has to go to Ames, Iowa. Everything in the country has to go to Ames, Iowa to be confirmed. And that that's the gold standard definitive. So everything. All of these tests are usually tested. All these samples, if, if a positive shows up, they're tested two to three times. To ensure that in fact it is definitely positive so um do, will this lab will our in-state lab be able to handle all the capacity we don't know just yet because we ain't got it up and running but i got every faith in our department of agriculture we got some folks here tonight with us uh and and i think it, it's cooperative effort between us but we still have the uh overflow capacity that can go to wisconsin as well so so we have you know, plenty of testing capabilities uh, across, you know, available to us. So, uh, um, so we're, we feel pretty good about that. We're just happy to be able to have it here in state because it's going to be so much more effective to have our folks doing it here. When I say our, I'm talking about North Carolina folks doing it here and hopefully shorten that time frame just a little bit. But it's still going to have to go, the sample's still going to have to go to Ames, Iowa to be, yes, definitively, that's what it is. That's just the way the process works. It's, it's a double check process. That's the way it works. Or, or Ames, Iowa is a national veterinary lab. And it's maybe a Philly, Philly, I don't even, I mean, I'm gonna speak out of turn if I know whether it's affiliated with the university or not, but it is the national veterinary lab. Do you know? It's, it's affiliated with the university, yeah. And Wisconsin's is affiliated with Wisconsin as well. Any other comments? All right, so comments will be accepted from the public through May 20th. We have three ways that you can uh, submit your comments, either through the mail, you can email regulations at ncwildlife.org. And we also have an online public comment portal that you can access through our website. Um, we do encourage you to submit any comments that you have on these regulations. And as I previously mentioned, um, we do have a CWD webpage set up and information will be added to that resource as we get closer to the hunting season and as surveillance continues. So we encourage you to check out that webpage. There's a lot of good information and videos on there. And we appreciate your attendance tonight and participation and the hearing is closed. Thank you. <laughs>